Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Panther Grind Inside Google. I am Mia Nelson, a rising senior business administration major with a concentration in marketing, and I currently serve as the president of Pre-Alumni Council. I want to personally thank you all for joining us this evening. Tonight, we have expert CAU alumni that will be sharing a wealth of knowledge and insight at working at Google. To start our evening off, we will begin with prepared questions for the panelists. Then we're going to transition into audience questions utilizing the chat. Overall, this program is scheduled for about 75 minutes, so we should be allotted enough time for every and everyone to answer the questions. All right, sounds good. All right, so for this evening, we have four awesome panelists. First up, we have Ebony Bradley. Ebony is from Dallas, Texas, a 2014 graduate of Clark Atlanta University. She has over seven years of professional experience, four years in campus university programs and three years in technical recruitment. She recently joined Google as a tech recruiter specializing in product management. Then we have Lawrence Presley. Lawrence Presley Jr. is currently the head of tech talent diversity where he currently oversees the hiring of black tech talent across Google North America. Prior to joining Google, Lawrence spent five years as a recruiter and a business development manager within the consumer products industry. Next, next up, we have Jamar Thomas. Jamar Thomas is a cloud technology evangelist helping government agencies solve business challenges through technology. He currently serves as a customer engineer at Google and has over 17 years of experience in sales and delivery. Most recently, Jamar has been recognized as the top performing customer engineer in the state and local government West region in 2021. Before joining Google, Jamar serves as a technology executive. Jamar is a proud graduate of Clark Atlanta University and he currently resides in Los Angeles, California. When he's not on his computer, you can typically catch him at the beach playing volleyball. And then last but not least, we have Jasmine Wright. Jasmine is a 2012 graduate of Clark Atlanta University from Dallas, Texas. She has over eight years of digital marketing experience. She recently relocated to the Bay Area to join Google as a senior account manager, work, working across tech B2B vertical with clients such as Dropbox and Oracle. All right, next I would like to introduce Dr. Lori L. Sadler, the Vice President of Alumni Relations and Engagement. Thank you, Mia. Thank you so much. Good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. As Mia said, I am Lori Sadler and I have the pleasure to serve as Vice President of Alumni Relations and Engagement here at Clark Atlanta University. Under the leadership of the fifth president of Clark Atlanta University, Dr. George T. French Jr., we continue to raise the profile and expand the university's footprint. On behalf of more than 30,000 very powerful and influential alumni, it is the charge of my office of alumni relations and engagement to continue to amplify our legacy. And we do so this evening as we reveal our third installment in this discussion series, The Panther Grind. Our intention with this series is to bring forward cutting edge topics, industry insights like we'll hear tonight, and in some cases, courageous conversations that are of high interest and high impact. In this series, we want to showcase the talent that is produced right here at CAU by spotlighting our alums who are committed to the grind and who are making tomorrow's history today. We hope that you enjoy the discussion, that you are challenged, and that you even take away nuggets that might prove helpful for you on your journey. And please feel free to share back with us how this positively impacted your grind. Again, thank you for joining us. And Mia, I hand it back over to you. All right, thank you. All right, so let's jump right in. So we're gonna start with the first question that I know everyone wants to know. How did you guys first get started with Google? I can, I can take that one. So <clears throat> my journey was a little bit different. Um, 
I joined Google back in uh, 2016 and I actually received a phone call at work. So um, I was working at a company called Georgia Pacific at the time they had reached Well, they reached out to me at work and I thought it was a joke. Um, and basically they found me because I had previously been, I think I was nominated for some um, SHRM award for human resources. And basically the way that we recruit talent is, is very, very unique. We have like really, really cool ways that we can like find top talent in the market. So long story short, they found me there, found my contact information at Georgia Pacific. They gave me a call. I thought it was a joke. Um, it wasn't until like I actually had to fly out to interview. Then I realized like, wait a minute, this is this is like the real deal. So didn't really prep that much for the interview because I wasn't sure if it was real. Um, but yeah, so that's that's pretty much how I got into the company. Do we have anybody else that would like to answer that one? Okay, cool. Yeah, so uh, my experience, uh, like mentioned, I started out in digital advertising. So I've always worked um, within the Google Ads platform doing search. Um, I got invited to a Google event in Dallas um, that was actually for diverse talent, um, just explaining to you like the process of how to apply. Um, and then you were able to network towards the end. Um, I passed my resume out to a few Googlers that were there at the event. Um, within like two to three days, uh, I got a call from um, my recruiter and that began my journey back in 2019. And then the pandemic hit and right before my client pro for my candidate profile was about to expire um, and oppor two opportunities opened up. And then so I was able to interview and was able to join Google during the pandemic. That's great. Anyone else? Yeah, for me, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. For me, um, I decided during the pandemic, I decided to make a switch from healthcare into tech. And with that decision, I decided to relocate myself to the Bay Area, which is, you know, pretty much a, a tech hub. And from there, started a university recruitment role at a tech company here and three months into that role, three months into moving applied at Google and received um, some positive feedback from Google. And in September of last year, I joined as a product manager recruiter here. Great. So I know everyone here knows what Google is, but we don't, we don't work for them. So what can you tell us are some benefits about working at Google? Yeah, I, I can, I can, I can start. Um, you know, if you, work long enough, uh, you're going to realize that healthcare is really important. And that's something that, you know, I've worked with other companies in, in the last 17 years, and Google stands out by far in that space. Um, in terms of costs, in terms of, you know, health offering, I think that's something that goes kind of undersold when you're looking at, you know, your different, you know, potential uh, jobs that you may want to work for. So that is a huge, big benefit. Um, there's a bunch of cool, uh, you know, benefits that I'd like to hear some, some from some of the other Googlers and some of the things that they like to uh, um, benefit from. But when I say, so for example, when I go in the office, right, you, we have a, uh, a coffee shop with baristas, right? So I like to drink coffee. I need caffeine to get my day started. You have unlimited access to that, right? You have uh, chefs that cook really great breakfasts and, and, and lunches. Um, you have massage rooms that you can leverage. And, and, and if you do well, they give you credits you and get these massages. There's, there's a lot of different cool perks that you get um, at Google, but you know, you know, that's, that's, that's the easy stuff. I really wanted to really highlight that, you know, the, the, the healthcare benefit package that they have at Google is, is really, really good. That's great. Some other good benefits, um, Google definitely invests in its employees as well. I know as a Noogler, they invest a lot like in your mental health and ergonomic workspace, workspaces, both in office and at home. Also as a Googler, you know, you're, you get to participate in programs for student loan repayment and also furthering your education to, you know, acquire different skills or to further your professional skills. Um, in whatever space that you're working in, Google helps a lot with that as well. 
great. I think as a as a society, we um, pay attention to more mental health nowadays. So that's great that you mentioned that, that they notice that and, you know, actually benefit their employees. That's great. So name my next general question. Oh, Lawrence, did you want to answer that one? Go ahead. We can move on. OK, so what is your specific role in Google and what are some of your responsibilities? I'll go, I'll go first, I guess. I am a recruiter. <laughs> I recruit for product managers. So part of my responsibility is facilitating um, the final stages of the interview process uh, that candidates go through. So once you hit your on-site interviews through wrapping up your offer process, um, I facilitate that process for candidates. I can go next. Um... I'm a customer engineer. What does that mean? Well, it's uh, a role on the sales side. And so what we do is our connecting uh, or our customers have business challenges. So what kind of technology solutions or services can Google offer to solve those challenges? Our customers don't know how to resolve those challenges. And that's where I come into play and I say, hey, we can use this. We have this whole portfolio of technology service that we can bring to the table that reside in our cloud uh, to solve this particular problem. Great example, uh, state of Hawaii, they had to shut down because of the pandemic, uh, lost tons of revenue uh, because of that, really impacted the economy, it's driven by tourism. So they wanted to figure out a way that they could start to reopen safely. Right, and so that's where we were to come to the table, uh, designed a, a uh, an application where, if you, some folks probably on this on this on this meet have have went to Hawaii during the pandemic, they phased out the program in March. But if you did, you would know you know that there's a safe travel application that you have to go to. You upload a, a COVID test. Um, you know, it uses Google AI behind the scenes to be able to determine that that test is negative, that it was taken within a certain amount of time. You also have to fill out your demographic and travel information so that Hawaii can, you know, safely manage kind of travelers and increase the amount of travelers from, you know, it dropped down to say in the hundreds to over 30,000 travelers a day and be safe and manage kind of that COVID pandemic. So that was a Google solution. Uh, that I was able to help in, in shape and design for them. And now I'll go ahead and go. So for me, so I, I oversee all of our Black Plus um, hiring across Google North America on the tech side. So uh, my role consists of making sure that we are um, attracting top talent in the market, not only attracting that talent, but ensuring that there's fair and equitable hiring uh, processes when they're actually going through our interview process. So um, I manage a team. Um, I have a couple of, of, of recruiting leads who report into me. And what we specifically do is, is make sure that like our focus is Black Plus talent. So that's the talent that, that all of our recruiters are engaging with. Um, those are the, that's the talent that we're actually hiring into the company. And that goes across several technical profiles, including like software engineering, and then something even that's like somewhat non-technical of program managers. And a lot of times like externally, people don't know that we have those roles. So in my role is important that I'm partnering with our, our marketing team and our PR team to make sure that folks know that those roles actually exist at Google. So um, when you look at the will of diversity, Basically, my role is on the, the recruiting side is making sure that we are not only bringing those people into Google, but making sure that they're getting through our interview processes and, and uncovering roadblocks if needed in that process. Yeah, so I'm an account manager. I'm in sales also. So I am pretty much the front line of the day to day context with my clients that I work with. So bringing in, they spend money across Google, which you see within the ad space, they spend money across YouTube. I work heavily with them, trying to help them up level that so they're able to see that return on their particular back end. And at that same time, with that extra return, put more money back into Google and YouTube. 
So it deals a lot with troubleshooting, um, putting together different proposals um, and letting them know various product rollouts. Um, Pretty much, you're very much like their parent, like you're with them, helping them every step of the way um, and helping them grow within their roles. That sounds great. All of you guys' roles sound very hectic. Would you say it's very hectic? You say no, Lawrence. Lawrence is shaking his head, but it very much. <laughs> I mean, I think it. I think it depends. Like in my world, it's not hectic, but it's sometimes just being real, like bringing people along the journey of what representation is. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's a lot of folks who just are really unaware. I have to think about a company like like Google, like it's a global company. So most of the people that I'm working with are at a global scale. Either they've relocated to the U.S. or et cetera. So just them having that knowledge of what, like, what are some of the things that are going on in the, in the Black community? Like they necessarily may not know. Right. And giving them the space and the grace to bring them along on the journey um, with them, like literally saying like, I need help. I don't understand this. And can you please bring me along? Because in my country, this is something that is not addressed. Um, even when we look at diversity in the U.S., it's a little bit different from how it is overseas. Um, like like countries like like Asia, for example, when we're looking at representation, we're only looking at it from male versus female versus here in the U.S., it's Black, it's Latinx, it's a women, it's veterans. So it's it's a lot different global on a global scale than it is here in the U.S. And Google is a global company. And having those employees work here sometimes like, you have to give people that space to just to be honest, like, Hey, I don't know this Mm -hmm. and and sort of try to bring them along. That's absolutely important because I think it's not always about they're trying to be disrespectful. It's just, they genuinely do not understand. So you have to be, you have to advocate for yourself and your culture and your ethnicity. So that's very important. Yeah. And, and I would say I would I, I don't want to use the word hectic, but I would I would say busy. Um, and it's just about how you manage the busyness. Mm-hmm. You can manage it, then it's not so hectic. But it can get very busy, especially on the sales side, supporting multiple accounts and trying to drop, get these sales through. Right, every quarter, there's a lot of you know work and a lot of you know efforts behind that right so but as long as it's it's you can manage it and there's there's ways to go about managing that work right you can keep a, a sane mind and and things fluctuate you know not every week is is a hectic week that's that's very good so next i'm going to go to my specific questions for the panelists so i'm going to start with you mr thomas um so what has been your career path and how do you feel the path has led you to an organization like google yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, let's, let's, let's start. Let's, let's figure this out. This journey that I've, I've taken, uh, well, it started off at Clark, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, graduated with a computer science degree. So that's how I got into tech. Um, and then from there, you know, my first job out of school was with a consulting firm and the first client I had was the state of California, um, child support enforcement division we had to build a um, centralized automated statewide child support system, which California did not have at that time. And I came in as a developer. Uh, So, you know, did that well, and eventually um, ended up becoming more of a technical architect and started, you know, uh, uh, was focused on delivery with many different uh, clients uh, LA County, uh, California Public Employee Retirement System, um, Ohio Public Employment Retirement System, my relationship started to build in the government sector. And so that's how my, you know, my, that's kind of where my career has taken me. So now it's, it's focused on the government sector industry. Uh, let's see. So did that for uh, several years and eventually became an executive. And it was at that point where we were expected not just to deliver, but also to drive the business through sales. Okay. So now you kind of see where I'm getting at. And, you know, that harkens back to, you know, and I was able to be successful there. And, and the reason for that, I'd like to share this story is 
in high school, my first job was selling shoes at Foot Locker, right? Um, well, technically I had another job, but we don't talk about that because I got fired in two days. Um, <laughs> anyway, it was, uh, I was getting paid under the table, so it doesn't really count. It was off the books. But, you know, at Foot Locker with my, with my colleagues, our coworkers, you know, one of the things that they, you know, they would stress to me is that you have to sell multiples, right? It's not just about selling a shoe. People coming into Foot Locker, they're going to buy a shoe. What else do they need? Right. And so, you know, I've always remembered that and that's always helped me. Right. So somebody comes into Foot Locker, they look like me, you know, my age, they want some drip. Right. So I'm selling them some some shoe strings. Right. Or some a fresh white tee or T-shirt. Somebody like my mom might come in there. Right. I'm going to sell her some insoles. Right. So, you know, <laughs> been on her feet for all day. So she needs some insoles. Right. But knowing what your, your, your customers need. So that took that taint same mindset, right, and applied it to, to business, right? So we're implementing this, this system for uh, LA County, uh, the L integrated eligibility system for, you know, health benefits, financial benefits, food benefits uh, to support their citizens, right? And we have that system that's going well, but, you know, I see that there's a, another need, right? I see some of the staff members are have these manual process that they're doing. And I'm saying, hey, you know, we could build a page within the, this application or this additional screen that would actually save X amount of time, right? Make it much easier for the staff to operate. And by the way, we could do it and the change order costs about $200,000, right? But it's gonna save you this much money. And then, they, you know, hear that and they're like, you know what, that makes a lot of sense but we'll give you a month to go ahead and build that out, right? And so it's like, okay, so that's that's kind of where I started going. Now, at that time I was doing both delivery and sales and that's a lot of effort, right? I like my weekends, right? I don't wanna have to work seven days a week. Um, I like to play beach volleyball. I wanna spend time with my wife, right? And so eventually I said, all right, well, I wanna focus just on sales. And around that time, a um, another uh, uh, a software company was starting their cloud business and they needed uh, to grow in the government sector. I said, okay, great. You know what, let me switch over and let me drive, you know, your business from that perspective. And so that's how I ended up transitioning over to cloud. All right. So we got, you know, the, I'm in the government sector, right. Focus on cloud. Um, this is all great. And then eventually Google, made a statement that they wanted to be number one in cloud, right? They've been crushing it and everything else, YouTube and maps and, you know, search. And they want to take that same technology and they've been in cloud, but they actually want to be number one in cloud. So they didn't want to grow their business. And so that's how I ended up transitioning over. I had some re uh, relationships over at Google. Uh, and so I ended up uh, switching over. So that's kind of my career journey. And that's what I'm doing today. Great. It sounds like a very journey, but you knew you had a straight focus and you knew what you wanted to do. So it's, you know, it was, it was work, it set for you and it's clearly working. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny because I, I didn't start off out of school knowing where I was going to go. Things just kind of ended up going that, in that direction. And then I just ran with it. Right. And so it, 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 it depends, I guess, for everyone else. Yeah, it's definitely like not about where you started, but it's about where you're going, where you ended up, where you end up. Yes, I agree. All right, so next I have a question for you, Ms. Bradley. So who or what has helped you get to where you are and what advice would you get to those who want to stay in that same direction? Okay, sure. Um, so my path to Google, I, I, I invested a lot in my experience in the field. So um, in recruiting and any HR job, I think it's very important to like invest in your experience. Obviously your degree is very important as well, but I think more so in the recruiting and, um, HR field ex experience holds a lot of weight as well. So I started out in agency recruiting, did that for about a year and then transitioned over to corporate recruiting. Um, and I did that just to be able to learn like the industry standard software tools they use to recruit and things like that. From there, I transitioned into university recruiting for a few years where I got used to speaking at events and, and just networking with different people. Um, did university recruiting in the healthcare sector for about four years. And 
Um, advice that I have for other people is to, it's important to get out your comfort zone. I think moving away from like my hometown or cities that I was just used to living in was my biggest success. Um, of course, you know, it's not a necessity for you to have to move to be able to get the job you want, but moving and broadening your horizons and really open up, opening up your mind to other opportunities will kind of put you at the forefront of a lot of opportunity to, opportunities that you may not have had like at home. Mm -hmm. So I always encourage people to like do some research and find out where's the best place to be for, you know, whatever professional skill you're pursuing and get up and move, you know? So um, Upon moving here, literally, I mean, Google has always been obviously like a dream job. You know, everyone wants to work for Google. And I always said I would pursue working for Google. Ha had you told me a year before I moved that I would be moving to California and that Google would hire me three months later, I'd have been like, you're crazy. You're nuts. So I just always, you know, like to tell that story and encourage people to get out your comfort zone. Um, I wish I would have done it right out of college or sooner. Um, it really does help a lot. So yeah, be open to moving and be open to relocation. Take that city off your resume, delete it off of there and be open to whatever the best opportunity is for you. That's awesome that you said that because I come from, I'm from St. Louis and I know a lot of my friends, like they, they're not open to going out new places, but I definitely think even though I moved here for school, moving to Atlanta shaped me like a little bit into who that I am today, because it's like, I'm not surrounded by the same things that I grew up around. So I definitely think you don't have to live for way from home forever, but I definitely think it's good for you to see new things and learn new things and learn more about yourself and living on your own. It's definitely a big part of growing up. Absolutely. I moved to a place where I didn't know anyone and at all, everything just fell in place. I met, you know, you know, me and Jazzy, we live very close to each other. We had no idea each other, you know, we would find each other again here from, you know, from school days, but um, it all works out. So don't be afraid to, again, step outside that comfort zone and go for what you want. All right. So next I have a question for you, Mr. Presley. So your title at Google specifically includes diversity and inclusion. What are some initiatives that Google has implemented to ensure diversity and inclusion? So there, there are several initiatives um, that, that we've done. If you, if you look at it from a financial commitment, um, we've invested over $100 million uh, for grants for small uh, businesses. Um, that includes Black and Latinx, Latinx businesses. Outside of that, uh, we've uh, given CAU, for an example, a $5 million grant uh, to help with some of the inequalities when we look at uh, pipelines to, at, to the roles that, that we have here at Google. Um, we've invested that money not only at CAU, but at, at a couple, couple of other um, historically black colleges and or universities. Uh, we've extended um, what was called Howard West to uh, the tech exchange program. Not only does it cover um, one HBCU, but actually covers all HBCUs and historically serving uh, Hispanic institutions as well. Um, from a, a side of like what we've done in the company to make sure that that people are feeling included in the work that we do. Um, we've done a ton of things. Uh, when you look at the way that we hire talent now, I can speak just, just bluntly. Back in 2016, when I joined Google, uh, we literally, I remember being a recruiter and I was originally given like a list of um, Ivy League schools. And, and that was like the that's where we started. That's where we literally found talent uh, from 2016 to, to now, especially being on this team. We've changed the entire landscape of how we attract talent. So so Jazzy talked a little bit about um, a program where she went to an event and she was able to get her resume out to recruiters. Um, and then we basically brought her to Google. And I remember like it was yesterday when I got the email about you potentially joining, um, I was like, whoa, like it's crazy. Like there are how all of this comes back together. Um, we've, we've done a lot with our referral program. So um, a lot of folks don't know this, but when I joined in 2016, it was more so, who do you know? Google was a company who literally hired based off of who did you know in the market? Um, in fact, I, I can remember like yesterday, I wrote all of these folks' names down in a, in a, in a tricks 
Uh, it's basically like an Excel sheet, but we call them tricks. It's like Google, but I wrote all the names down and, and it's like doc. It was like, these are great people who I've gone to school with or work with or et cetera. And we've literally cascaded that list across Google. And over the years, when some of these folks are getting hired, I'm like, whoa, I remember putting their name down years ago and, and now they're at Google. So we've done a great job with changing that program to be a little bit more inclusive. Um, so no longer are we asking for it in, in that realm. However, we do explicitly ask for refer referrals from our uh, talent across Google. So there's a ton of things that we're doing um, that we've done in the last five years as far as looking years ahead. Um, I do eventually think that my team won't exist. Um, and, and the reason that I think it won't exist but because I think there's so many things that we're putting in place to get everybody on board and, and know how to uh, find and, and, and hire black tech talent and not just my, my team isn't, well, my org isn't just black tech talent. There's someone who's ahead of Latinx talent, someone who's ahead of uh, people with dis disabilities and also uh, military veterans, someone who's the head of women, someone who's the um, head of native, native talent. So um, we are putting things in place now. Um, so in, in 10 years, I really want to work myself out of a job, honestly. I want us to get to a place where we're not only investing in these communities, but we're actually bringing those people here to Google because without those people at the table, this is so important with like, it's different from having a role, but having a role of influence. When you're looking at the people who are on this, on this call, you have Jazzy who's directly impacting minority businesses in the market. You have Ebony who has a chance to hire and uh, retain black tech talent or whatever the, the demographic of that talent is. Um, and you have Jamar who's actually working with these customers to build like equitable um, equitable organizations when it comes to the, the products that they're using. It's important that when you're in these roles of influence that you're actually influencing and having a seat at the table because you there have been times where people are sitting at the table and they don't say anything. But what I will say here at Google this is the only company that I've worked at that allows you to literally have a voice and you can push whatever that initiative and or agenda that is. If you have that buy-in, usually those things get approved because all of our approvals usually come from a team level, then it goes up. It's not a, it's not a top-down company where leadership just sends out an email and we just go for it. No, all of the grassroots things that happens here at Google, and I have seen this myself being in recruiting, started at the team level. And now with me being at the table to make those decisions, I'll be honest with you, we're, we're making a lot of changes that, that you'll start to see at the company and in the tech industry. That's awesome. I definitely love the idea that you guys are not only working for now, but you're working for the future. And so I, I hope you find another job, but I'm glad that your team may not exist in about 10 years. That's awesome. All right, so lastly, for Ms. Wright, I have a question for you. So as a Black woman working at Google, what has been the most important relationship for you to develop in the workplace? Mia, I just got to commend you. You're, like, doing a really great job. Like you're making Thank you. Great. Thank you. But, um, personally, I think the most important relationship for me is coming from my core team. Um, that's who I'm working with day to day, day in, day out. Those are the people that can comment on your work. But most specifically, like my manager, um, she is a woman, um, but she doesn't look like me. We are a diverse team, but I'm still the only me currently. So it is important to me that she understood like what I deal with um, versus what like another team member might deal with. So I'm very vocal about certain words that I don't like associated with my passion as like, oh, you're seeming frustrated. Like I'm very vocal about the emotions that I have and then I will let you know when I'm frustrated. I don't need you to put that specific word in my mouth and then letting her know how that plays back into like black women are looked at as very high strung, strong, like just aggressive type women. And when it's like, I'm having the same type of passion that you are and as well as the other team members. Um, very vocal uh, with the account executive that I work with, especially because we are attending all the meetings together. We're working directly with the clients. So very vocal about my view, my point of view on it. Um, 
how I like to go into meetings prepared versus like super on the fly. Like I'm comfortable with on the fly, but like let you and I just quickly get our game face ready for when we go in this meeting, because I don't have the luxury of just like representing myself. I'm representing someone that I do not know that's trying to come up behind me and who's to say my client isn't isn't about to like hire a black person and then they see like oh well we met with our google account manager she was super unprofessional now i'm pushing ebony to the back of the line because i don't want that in my meeting so it's very important to like show like i know what's going on to be more vocal to lead certain meetings to let them know when i prefer for you to let me lead and you kind of just be my co-host and chime in on certain areas because I need to let them see me in a position of leadership and not always leaning on you because like Lawrence mentioned we're not a top-down company so you see seeing my account executive on an email might still not get something handled quicker so it's all about building that and making sure like you let them know if certain words you don't want them using I don't want you to associate it with me because I will let you know how I feel. That's good. I definitely was going to throw in a question on because you are a black woman in tech and we kind of correlate that with corporate almost as how, as you spoke on that stigma of being a strong black woman, but it may come off as different. How do you, how do you, how do you cope with that? How do you say, Oh, I'm not, being disrespectful I'm not coming off as rude or arrogant it's just you guys are invalidating my feelings and I have to stand up for myself so how do you take that just how you said it you said it beautifully and people accept that no one comes back there's not an email later no one's tapping you on the shoulder saying you know pack up it's time Mm -hmm. to go no one's doing that so it's about you making sure you're letting them know how you feel and in the same vein like if if it's too much at a time or you're just like, hey, I need a breather. Let me take a second. Like, it's okay to be just a little vulnerable about if things are just a little too heavy. Mm-hmm. Like, yes, I can handle it and I can bear it, but also I don't mind if you want to take this particular deliverable off my plate. Mm-hmm. That's good. I definitely think uh, we needed to hear that because people can take what you say in a wrong direction. And it's like, you didn't mean it that way. That's just how you took it. But I think it's good because you do have to advocate for yourself and let people know your boundaries so they don't overstep or don't miscommunicate. All right, guys, so thank you for that. So now we're gonna transition back to our general questions that any of you panelists can answer. So we're gonna start, what is the biggest challenge working at Google? I'll, I'll answer that from my perspective. I think one of the, the biggest challenges that that I face personally is that I'm in a role where, if you all didn't know, I'm, I'm Black, right? And I'm overseeing all of representation when it comes to Black tech talent across Google. And oftentimes, especially being in diversity, like you never turn the switch off, meaning that the things that impact you outside of work, you kind of bring those to work. For example, the George Floyd, um situation that was really like a challenge for me right coming back to work being in this space and then telling my staff and leads to get their teams to reach out to black candidates to say hey we have a job for you so how do you convey those messages how do you make sure that we're we're thoughtful and how we're reaching out to candidates and and how we're just taking care of each other at work and i think in 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 my line of work of diversity because i'm in meetings constantly about these things that are happening, the microaggressions, right, that that Jazzy talked about a little bit earlier, Um, the things that are happening outside of work, um, the things that were happening even when I joined in 2016. So when I joined Google, you had to literally move to Mountain View. There There was no going anywhere else. So I started my career in Mountain View. It was great at work. It was it was like Willy Wonka in the chocolate factory at work. But once you left work, there was literally no one who looked like me at the streetlight because I lived in Silicon Valley. So sometimes that is a challenge where you have to live and breathe this work because it is like the career that you do, but also acknowledging that you are a person of color and specifically black. And a lot of times 
you do become the person. Hey, Lawrence, I'm not understanding why, you know, I, I mean, I've said this to someone at work and, and they said that I shouldn't use words like frustrated or et cetera, like I'm, but I'm not understanding why they're feeling that way. Can you bring me along? So sometimes that becomes frustrating because you are often the go-to person to answer the questions for Black people. I, I remember sitting in Mountain View in 2017 and I'm in a diversity meeting and literally I was the only Black person in that meeting. It was probably about 20 of us and someone literally said, um, it, I mean, in a circle of friends, like they they literally said like, hey, like we want to start reaching out to black sororities and fraternities. Like, let's reach out to uh, the alphas versus another group because they're known for this. Isn't that correct? And I'm like, no, that's that's not necessarily correct. But those are things that that. I sometimes like bother me because but then I have to realize, wait a minute why are they asking me those things and maybe they haven't they haven't learned about that before so they're only making assumptions based off what they see on tv or what they've heard or etc so now i have to bring this person along so when i initially took this role it was a lot of bringing people along and then ultimately I, i've just opened up that space and, and let that guard down to say like hey they may just not know and it's okay that i have to give them that space and that grace to, to be who they are but also correct them when I need to correct them. That's good. It also goes back into the advocating for yourself, because like you said, people don't, it's not them being in, arrogant or ignorant, it's them not understanding. So that's good that not only you are being asked those questions because you're the only person of color in the room, but because you're now answering those questions because that's what you do. You are the in diversity and inclusion. So now you're teaching not only because of the color of your skin, but because of your, your job title. So that's very important. It's like it di directly correlates with that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add in, uh, you know, I think the being 100% remote um, has somewhat been a challenge for me uh, that I've had to deal with, mainly because, well, you know, from a, it's a mental health perspective, I like to be around people. Uh, especially in a customer sales role, we need to be in front of customers, right? Uh, so it's challenging to develop relationships, et cetera, et cetera, when you are on Zoom calls like this, for example. Um, but, you know, the other aspect to that is also, you know, there's not a lot of us in technology roles. So oftentimes when I'm doing business, I'm out in the field, I'm not seeing a lot of people that look like me, to be frank, right? One of the things that I like about Google is that when I go into the office, it's a very diverse office and there's a, a lot of people that look like me in the office and that makes me feel very comfortable. So, you know, when I started at Google, I used to enjoy going into the office because I could, I would be able to communicate and speak with people on a professional level and look, dress, talk just like me, right? Come from HBCUs and I really like that part. It made me feel, um, you know, like, a, you know, like Google's a family and, and, and that less isolated, right? And so that's one of the things that, you know, what I've gotten used to and I figured how, what works for me, especially in this kind of remote um, setup. But now that we're kind of in this hybrid model, I'm, you know, actively going back into the office, you know, a few times a week, just so I can make sure I keep those connections because I think that helps with my mental health. So it, it's tough, you know, sometimes you don't really have that support system, I feel like, um, uh, unless you go out and seek it. It's not natural because you don't necessarily feel comfortable when you don't see a lot of people like you. So um, that really has helped me, I think, from, um, you know, from my standpoint. Yeah, I definitely think the virtual is different for everyone. And But it's good that you are able to still go into the office and see, like I said, keep those connections and, you know, keep your mental health in check because it's very important. All right, so the next question I have for you guys is, what is the best resource for people who want to learn more about working at Google? So I think utilizing uh, Google's career pages are, are very helpful. And also um, updating your LinkedIn and connecting and networking with different recruiters in place because the good thing about Google, like Lawrence was saying, like he has a whole team that specializes in connecting, you know, with 
you know, people of color, especially. And so just putting yourself out there and making yourself visible so that those recruiters and those teams can connect with you. So like I said, lots of networking. Um, if you see any events, you know, if you follow people on, on LinkedIn, they'll post a lot of different events that you can attend and pass out your resume to and things like that uh, once, as we start to get back, you know, in person with the events. And yeah, just make sure you're keeping an eye out on that careers page and, and really researching those roles that align with your skill sets before you apply. Great. All right, so next, what are the common misconceptions people would have about working at Google? A ton of things. Uh, one, people think that you have to be in, like you have to have a software engineering degree my degree is in public relations and I've <laughs> never been tech at all. Um, another thing would be that folks think that if they join Google, they'll just be a number. Um, I can only speak on my personal experience. I, I haven't felt that way. Um, I felt that people have invested in my career. In fact, I've, I was bold the day that I joined. I told my manager in our first one-on-one -on -one that I wanted to be a manager and immediately was on that path for that. So I think not only advocating for others, but you, you really have to advocate for yourself. And I think sometimes people think that if you join a company this large, I think we're at 100,000 employees, um, that you can't do that, but you can. You just have to be bold enough to do it and, and find the, the right sponsors and or mentors throughout whatever it is that you're trying to do and, and help bring you along the way. Um, another misconception that I would say that a lot of people just based off of like the numbers that you see when it comes to diverse report that's directly from my team uh so a lot of times people will say well google isn't diverse right we're not trying to be a, a company that is, is putting representation first um because of what we see the, the the small numbers that that moves up and down uh yearly um but that's really due to several things. Um, and when you look at diversity holistically, um, trying to solve for who we hire, what we can't solve for, but we try to have like some type of impact on just like our, our pathways to Google, meaning what some of the racial inequalities that have taken place on an elementary level, right? Like look, if you look at the inequalities in education, uh, especially people of color not having access to computer science or the STEM programs at an early age and then trying to almost quote unquote play catch up like on a collegiate level sometimes puts us at a disadvantage when we're looking at other countries where people have that access as soon as literally elementary school and in other communities here in the U.S. So I think there's a lot of misconceptions that we're not trying to move the needle. It's just this space of representation and diversity, equity, inclusion. It, it's so nuanced that it's so many parts of that wheel that I was talking about earlier. Like we're only on the recruiting part, um, but there are other parts of the diversity because just because we recruit this talent, how do we ensure that we retain that talent? And not only do we retain that talent, are we making sure that they have the same experiences that our counterparts are, are experiencing at the company, because that's important too. So I think a lot of times, and it really sometimes like, it'll get to me because I know what we're doing internally. And just to hear like, sometimes people think, well, you're not really trying to do it X, Y, Z, because things that'll happen in the media and, and et cetera, that kind of like sets us back. But I do think that we are putting things in place. And I think if you just give us that space and grace that I keep talking about. I think we can get there together, especially with, with continue doing things like this on an, on an historically black college and university level. So I think a lot of the talent that we want is literally here. Mm -hmm. just, we just have to find a way to get them to Google, to get them interested. Cause I know Ebony can attest. I was a recruiter before the market has changed from reaching out and everyone just like, Oh, I want to work for Google. Well, not necessarily. Because if you see the compensation that's being paid across tech right now, if you see that everyone's investing in sites outside of the Bay Area or Silicon Valley, you see that everyone's now offering free food at work. So like what's going to make us a little bit different? And I think for us, I can't speak for the other companies, but I will say for us, like we are literally trying to solve this and it, it, it is tough because you're in the trenches with it every day. And sometimes like it's not reciprocated outside of the company that people think that we're trying to do that. 
That's definitely important that you touched on the wheel because it's different parts of the diversity inclusion that people don't understand because I know when I talk to people and they think about diversity inclusion, you only think about, oh, what's the ratio or how many black to white or um, people of color that there are, but you don't think about the things that they're trying to do within the company and with inside themselves and their team that you don't really think about. So you push them to the side or give them a leeway because they don't necessarily have the ratio at that moment. But you don't think about in five years because of what they're implementing that they could have those ratios or even a bigger ratio that you would want to be a part of. That's definitely important. Yeah, and you also have to realize that the tech culture wasn't built overnight. So it's not gonna take overnight to undo certain cultures and to rebuild a different culture that's more inclusive for everyone. So like Lawrence was saying, you know, give a little grace sometimes when you hear the things in the media, like things don't change overnight, but I can agree that Google is making giant strides to really change um, culture, not just at Google, across the board, across the tech industry period, so. All right, so then my next question for you guys will be, what impact has the pandemic made on your experience? I know Jamar, you talked on this a little bit with your last question, but does anyone else have any? Um, I started in the middle of the pandemic, uh, literally in January. So I think I don't, I think my entire experience has been different from like Lawrence specifically, like he got to go in office immediately. Like I started back in Dallas um, on the computer, met all my team on the computer, met people I didn't know from the computer. And then it's like, you guys are going to come back in office, make this move. And then you get to an office where like, yes, I saw you on the VC, but I don't really know you. And now I'm like meeting you in person. And then like people want to hug you. And you're just like, (laughs) I'm comfortable with you over video, but we haven't like interacted in person yet. Like, (laughs) you don't understand, like, I'm going to want to talk at 8 a.m. Like you have to. And so now people are like having to learn that part of you. And um, just like some days how you might just not want to be talking to anyone. But I got the smile on and I'm here. So you're now like balancing that. So I think now like being back in office, I'm able to experience the things like the food or the various events that are taking place. So as that like starts to ramp up it makes you more excited about work rather than like like you're excited when you get the offer but then you're still like in your same living room that you've like been in so that now you're like now really feeling like oh I work at Google like I'm like in full swing of the tech community actually living in Oakland the Bay Area so now I feel like more of like a nugler now versus then what I did um, starting back in Dallas. So would you say that because you started online and then you transitioned into meeting those people and you said you're meeting a new side of them, would you say that it's harder to make those connections, harder to make those connections or it just makes it different? I think it just makes it different um, from a sense of like, you're kind of seeing like, people's personality in person you're seeing like oh like this is probably what you were doing at home when I couldn't like ping you and you weren't like responding back so it was more so just about like now how do people like to collaborate in person like people have different comfort levels like COVID yes they're saying it's over but it's not over so you're like also learning that as well so I think um, it's really just that in-person collaboration that you're like relearning again. Okay, that's great. Did anybody else have a big impact on their work experience from the pandemic? Not so much for me. I was super excited to come back into the office because out of all offices, it's like the Google office. So, you know, why wouldn't you be excited? But I had already been working from home since like 2014. So most of my career was already based remote. So I was just like super eager to like get back into the office more so really excited to for when people don't respond to my pings I could just walk on over and be like (laughs) hi with that you know so um but yeah I was just excited to meet new people again moving here not knowing anybody coming in the office like really helps with that because for a minute I did not 
know if I was going to make it. So <laughs> um, that helped a lot for sure. All right. All right. So I'm going to stick with you, Ms. Bradley. So my question for you specifically, as someone on the inside, what advice do you have for Black people trying to get a career in Google? Yeah. So I would say definitely um, invest in your, in your skills, study your craft, focus on uh, making yourself the best candidate, you know, for the role. Again, Google works really hard to put people in place to make sure that we're, we're moving that needle and moving that number um, to get more black talent in. So again, I would just like focus on your craft, focus on your experience, um, keep an eye out for those entry level programs like the bold internship and the many other internships and programs and mock interview programs that they have. Definitely stay up on your networking. And once you do get into Google, make sure you stay involved to make the, to make the most out of your experience here as well. Okay, great. So I know we spoke on this whole time we've been talking about the advocate for yourself and you just um, spoke on making sure you're the best candidate. How exact specifically would you, let's say I didn't know how to advocate for myself or I just talked about my resume. How would you advise me to really make sure that I'm putting my best foot forward and make sure that I'm letting the interviewer know that I'm the one for them? Absolutely. I would definitely um, do some research on like resume writing and making sure that you're able to articulate your experience properly on your resume, as well as practicing interviewing. Interviewing is very important and it takes practice. Practice makes perfect. So make sure that you're giving yourself plenty of prep time and doing your research on interview questions and practice articulating your skills out loud to your interviewers as well. Yeah, that's definitely important. I know with myself, the interviewing part is so important. Like I try to just basically, I try to interview myself in the mirror before I meet the, with the actual interviewer because it's helping if you actually say it out loud, then, oh, I'm thinking about what I'm going to say, but you're not speaking it out loud. You're not articulating your words and everything. So, and also mock interviews help a lot, you know, doing exactly what you said. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, I wanted to take a little bit further. Um, it's specifically when you are creating that resume, what Google looks at a lot, honestly, it's going to be data. So having like numbers on your resume. So you've increased this by X percent. You grew this company or sales revenue by, by Y. Like that's what we want to see. And then in the interview process itself, just think, just put your mindset of like problem solving, like one thing that we didn't all say, and I, and I know we all see this in our roles every day, is really about solving problems. Every day there's a new problem to solve. And just when you thought that you've solved that problem, there's another problem. So take that same approach with the interviews. Um, when, when you're getting those questions, um, or even if you're just having a conversation with a recruiter, like you want to make sure that you talk about like your way to problem solve, not necessarily get into the right answer, but how you all are able to solve problems. Like what is that thought process? using that star method, um, ensuring that you are like considering all outcomes and roadblocks and solving for those um, in your in your answer. So, yeah, that's definitely um, a big thing. You said the star method. I think ever since I found that out and been using that, it's been so helpful because you it's, it basically plans out your interviewing, how you answer the question. It plans it out for you. So as long as you have those, it's a guarantee. All right, so I see the chat is actually booming right now. So we're going to skip, we're going to go right there and answer some questions. So the first question in the chat I see from Mark Carr is B for you, Ebony. So it says, "Hello, Ebony, how are you?" Um, that is a question. <laughs> and then you are an HR expert. How true is it that Google courses on Coursera are enough to be on Google? Besides them, do you need more to be considered if you are just starting out? Okay, so answer to the first question, I'm doing well. And then answer to your, your, your other questions is, um, I think those courses definitely can help, but that solely won't necessarily get you into Google. Again, you have to make sure that, you know, you're able to, first, that you have the 
experience and for entry level roles, you know, make sure just you're doing all the things that we said, you're practicing, you're interviewing, you are um, making sure to articulate the experience that you do have in your resume. And um, yeah, just practice that STAR method for interviewing. Now those courses can definitely help, but those courses alone, of course, won't, won't get you in. That's great. All right. And, and, and I would add, in addition to the STAR method, you know, take data-driven approaches to coming to your decisions within that, that, that STAR method. Um, so tr try to find ways that you can uh, quantify the, you know, the, the results or how you arrived at your ultimate, you know, solution or proposal, whatever it is that you're, you're, you're using as part of that interview. All right. So next up we have from Lenora McFadden. Um, can you be in tech at Google and not live in California? Are there other locations that are heavily tech or remote? Yes, to that question. So when we think about just like some of the things that we've done recently, we've invested in other locations. So now we have a have an office here in Atlanta. We've had one previously since 2001, but this new office is amazing. So uh, we have an office right here in Atlanta. I was able to relocate back to Atlanta. I know there's some other places that we've invested in, such as uh, Chicago, uh, D.C., uh, New York City. Um, in fact, I think there's like four new offices, well, two new offices um, in New York City. Um, invest investments in Austin as well. Um, outside of those areas, I mean, if you're interested in going to the Bay Area, you could go to the Bay Area or Seattle. Um, we have teams in Boulder. And then for remote, I mean, it's pretty much all over. I mean, my team, for example, I have someone who works in uh, Mexico City, and they're just remote, and they've, they've been remote thus far. So it's really up to, I would look at the, to Ebony's point, if you take a look at the career site, it will tell you where the location is. Usually remote would be the second option if you're not interested in that primary location. But then that's when you're trying to decide if you really want to be remote, because if you're remote, you won't get to experience some of those cool things that we talked about, because I'll be honest with you, the office is the office. I personally don't think you get an experience of Google until you're in the office. It is tough starting when you're only working from home. I think like if you do the office for the first six months and then go from home, like that's great. But it is a, it, and then if you go to Mountain View, that just adds on top of that because like I was in headquarters. So it's a lot different from actually being here in Atlanta where you're doing those big calls and you're there at the time with, with, um, uh, Larry and, and Sergey, you're right there with them versus you're at home. Well, now it's Sundar, but I've been here for a minute, but yeah. All right. All right. So my next question is from Jessica Jones. It says, hey, my name is Jessica Jones and I'm a 2020 graduate from CAU with a degree in computer science. I am currently pursuing a career at Google. I am just in the beginning phases where I have set up a champion call once that is complete on to interviews. I'm hoping to become a Google test engineer. I get it. All right, thank you for that. Or maybe maybe any advice for her? Um, yeah, I mean, I had a computer science background. I think uh, the panelists has described, you know, going to the careers website is a great uh, place to start. Um, I think uh, in, in terms of prepping for your interviews, just be confident, know that, you know, the computer science department has prepped you and uh, well right, for a career at Google. Um, so I don't know. If, if there's additional question, if there, if there is a question, Jessica, just go ahead and throw it in the chat. All right. All right, so next we have from Erica Bunton. Do any of you all have experience recruiting candidates who relocate internationally or for international overseas roles? I do know that Google does hire internationally. Um, they have a team specifically that um, hires for international uh, candidates. 
Lawrence, do you have any more insight on that at all? Yeah, I think it depends if, if they're international and trying to relocate to the U.S. Um, or if you're international and trying to stay in that company. So we have, I mean, it's a global company, so we have teams, recruiting teams all over. Um, but our recruiters, they can work with candidates depending on what those uh, visa statuses are and what uh, requirements that you'll need. But what we usually do is once a candidate applies, it goes through that, that team first um, to make a decision if we can move forward in the process or not um, because of whatever those visa uh, restrictions could be. But yes, to, to answer your questions, we do have experience working with them. But what is the actual, like, what you're trying to find out from there? All right. So the next one is from Shandrea Fleming. Would there be a referral code that we could use when we apply so the recruiters know that we attended this event so our applications won't get lost in the thousands of applicants? Just drop the names in on the resume, on the uh, application. So what people, a misconception, people think that we have like this online tool that weeds out resumes is actually not true. Um, so we have an online recruiting team and it's about 40 recruiters and they actually go through every single resume that people apply online. Um, so I would definitely apply online if, and then it's going to ask you, do you know someone who works at Google? And then you can put their, their name in there and then it'll automatically like that recruiter, whoever it is, they'll get something letting them know that you have applied to that role. That's great. All right. Next we have from Chelsea, probably Chelsea Foster. Um, sorry for, if I pronounce anybody's names wrong. Um, is there an office in Dallas, Texas? I just moved here about a year ago and I applied for apprenticeship program and selected LA, Atlanta and remote. Yes, there's an office um, out of, I think technically it's Addison, um, but in the Dallas area to answer your question, yes. All right. All right, thank you guys for your questions in the chat and thank you for answering. All right, so now we will have a closing question for our panelists. So what is one piece of practical advice you would give to someone starting out? completely fresh and they're coming in, what's one thing you would say to them? Don't be afraid to connect with people at Google. Um, when you start at Google, don't be afraid to throw time on people's calendar, learn as much as you can while you're ramping up because I think we can all agree that no matter what realm or no matter what department you're in at Google, once you ramp up, it's it, it doesn't stop, so. I would, I would get as much as advice and as much training as possible, pay attention to your trainings as well, and um, work on building relationships because you just never know when, when you're going to need help from somebody in, in any organization. So, Absolutely. Yeah, I would say uh, be confident. Um, imposter syndrome is a very real thing, right? But you have what it takes. And, you know, I share this story when I was, I think, a sophomore in, in, in college, I did an internship, a research internship at Caltech uh, in California, and it was really hard. I thought I was ready, and it, I, I didn't feel like I was prepared. Um, I lost my confidence, but I grinded through that program and, you know, ended well, right? And then, you know, the next couple years of school, worked really hard. Um, and then I, like I said, I started with this consulting firm. And then I want to say, you know, the first project, you know, when you start with a consulting firm, even though you get the job, you still got to interview for these projects. So I, I did, had an interview and that's when I got um, uh, booked the, uh, that project in, uh, in Sacramento and, uh, you know, crushed it. But a, a couple years later, uh, a, you know, the, the, the manager and, and a couple other people told me, uh, that when they interviewed me, I was the best interview out of all of the candidates for that role that they ever had, right? And so once I heard that, like, I've been confident ever since then, right? So just know that, look, Clark is, is prepared you guys, you guys, you know, it, 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 wherever, it, even if you didn't go to Clark, you're, you're attending this, um, you know, you have what it takes to be successful at Google or elsewhere, um, push the imposter syndrome to the side. Everybody has imposter syndrome when they start at Google. So don't worry about it. Just embrace it and, and move on. 
I would say Google will be lucky to have you. And that's what you got to remember. Like they sought you out. They continue to progress you through the interview process. Um, and so when you get there, I mean, it is about you doing you, you coming in, you're doing the work. It's not going to be a perfect place. Some days you just, you got a case of the Mondays, just like you do at your current company. So it's all about you making sure that you show why, like you chose to be a part of the company, why you chose to work with that particular team that you end up on. And then also, I just say, like, remember, like, as Black people, we represent our whole community. So I want to see more CAU people to come to Google. So I have to do well. So when you come, you need to do well so that that door can just like keep opening and they just start seeing CAU everywhere and they just automatically know if the person is from CAU, then they can do it. And trust me, you can you can do it just like how each and every one of us are there. Absolutely. All right, so I have one more closing question for you guys. What is your superpower? Um, I think mine is great. Uh, personally, uh, working in sales, we get, you know, we're trying to get clients to invest in different areas. And like you get told no a lot, but I like keep coming back stronger. I go back to the board myth busting. So I think that's really what my superpower is, is that I'm going to just keep coming each and every time a different way and producing great work. And I would say mine is probably just the ability to remain calm. I carry a very like high volume desk sometimes, and sometimes things can get a little chaotic, especially during these times, you know, during slash post pandemic, nothing is really too stable right now in life, in anyone's life right now. So um, it's a lot of ups and downs in, in recruitment. And like I said, it's a very high volume role to be in for me at least. And so you know, I've just learned over the years just to just to remain calm. Um, a lot of things are tomorrow's problem. And sometimes, you know, you just got to kind of protect your mental health and your your mental space and and keep keep moving along. I think for me, just always being willing to learn. Um, Google can humble you. I will be honest with you because everyone's smart. Like, and that's something I didn't believe until I got here because I'm like, there's no way that every single person that you work with is smart. But no, every single person that you work with is smart. Every single person is trying to solve a problem. And I think for me, even being in this seat dealing with uh, Black tech, there's a lot that I didn't know about Black tech. Um, and we can chat offline just like a lot of things, even with Juneteenth. Um, I, I think a couple of years ago, we got hit on Instagram from the shade room about a doodle um, from Juneteenth. And those were things that like I didn't necessarily know. So you have to be willing to learn. And for me, it's like I know that I'm on a journey as well, that I don't know everything and being vulnerable to, to come in rooms and say, hey, wait a minute. I don't even know what that word means. Can we can like tell me what that means or what is that data really saying? I think that has helped me um, matriculate here at Google over the last six years. Uh, let's see, I guess mine um, at Google, the technology problems that we face can be very complex. I think my superpower I do a great job of taking all of that chaos and diagramming the, 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 the problem or the solution to where people can then feel comfortable with our solution because it now looks a lot more simpler and it looks like, you know, it's one step from actually being a real thing, which allows our customers to feel confident that they can move forward and go ahead and sign their name on that contract, right? Um, so I think, you know, that's something that is, is, is one of my superpowers. And the other is maintaining my work-life balance, right? I can't remember who said this, but when it was a question, you know, when you, if I work on the weekend, do I ever get caught up? And the answer is no. 
there's always more work. And so once you understand that, it's just like, okay, you kind of create your own boundaries and you just maintain those. And guess what? You will still function and flourish um, um, in that. So those are the two things I'll call out. All right, great. So now we're going to have our closing remarks from Dr. Sadler. But before we get to that, I want to personally thank each and every one of you for joining this panel today. I've had so much fun. It's been so beneficial. I hope to everyone in the audience that this has helped you because it's helped me. And I just thank you guys for being here tonight. And Dr. Sadler, your turn. Awesome. Thank you, Mia. Thank you so much. And I will just say to your final question, I think we are learning what your superpower is. You are awesome. You are amazing. And I'm just going to steal that from Jazzy, who said you did an amazing, amazing job. If we could, I don't even want everybody to come off the, you know, mute, but just if we could just give Mia, just an applause. Thank you. You are outstanding. You killed it tonight. Thank you so much for all that you do. And this is just an example of the type of talent that we have here currently at CAU. And then our Googlers, our Googlers that are on the panel, the type of talent that we produce here at CAU. We certainly thank all of you for joining us tonight, for all the information you shared all the nuggets. I hope everybody was taking notes. I got pages of them um, just uh, that we can take with us and actually put into practice. Jazzy, thank you for your voice at the table. You represent us well. Ebony, for what you're doing, making sure that we show up, that we are represented at Google, that we have a fair opportunity to be there. Oh, wow. And Lawrence, didn't even know of your role um, prior to this conversation that that would even exist. You are awesome. You are awesome. Influencing from your seat. I heard that very clearly. Influencing from where you are, moving from influence to impact from right from where you are. Thank you for that nugget. And then Jamar, you talked about, you led us off with the food, the, the massage rooms. <laughs> uh, Dr. Lucas was actually on this call. I don't know if he heard that part, but I'm certainly planning to push that up the ladder here at CAU because um, the food and massage rooms, I heard that very clearly. The healthcare and then the investment in the people at Google. That's just um, really good information for us to hear. Those of us who work here at CAU, those of us who are interested in moving into roles at Google. Thank you so much for sharing. And then to the alumni relations and engagement team, I would be remiss. I know we're way over time, but I would be remiss if I did not take this opportunity to thank my awesome team um, and this vision that has come to life and is taking on an even greater life than we even anticipated is that of Miss Natalie Parker. And she's behind the scenes on, on, on here. And I don't know, I don't see her on my screen, but if anybody can see her, please just let her know that we appreciate what she does, putting together this platform for us telling our story. This is what we want to do. This is the charge of our office to amplify our legacy. And it's opportunities like this that we get to tell our story. So thank you, Ms. Parker, for your vision and for your execution. I saw Ms. Rick dial in. She's actually even on vacation. I saw her log in. She is like the engine in our office. So Ms. Ricks, thank you for joining us this evening for all that you do. And then Ms. Hill, who makes sure that I am where I'm supposed to be. And if any of you know me, that's not an easy task. So um, I always um, thank Ms. Hill, my right and left arm for all that she does. She's actually here with me in the office this evening. So I thank her for what she does. I mentioned Dr. Richard Lucas, our Vice President of Institutional Advancement. I saw him dial in. I'm not sure if he's still here, but I thank Dr. Lucas always for his support. He's always there rolling up his sleeves. And in this case, just putting things in the chat information. So Dr. Lucas, thank you for your support. I saw uh, Marshall Taggart dial in, our colleague there in, and most of you recognize his name as former um, president of our Alumni Association, Marshall Taggart. Thank you for joining. Uh, Stacy Robeson, my classmate who is here um, uh, back at CAU with us, and we're so glad that he's back. And 
I, I, I almost don't like to name names because I'll forget someone or I'll overlook someone, but I just wanted to, to um, acknowledge those that I see and for those that I don't see. Thank you all, Clark Atlanta University for showing up this evening, for being here. We appreciate your support. Thank you everyone. Have a great, great night.